you all for coming to this talk. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Very excited to be talking to you today and sharing uh, some of the research uh, and some of the work that my team has been doing. So my name is Justin Novak. I'm a senior security operations researcher at the Software Engineering Institute. Uh, the SEI, for those who don't know, is what's called a federally funded research and development center, and we're hosted at Carnegie Mellon University. So before I jump into the presentation and some of the research and the work that we're doing, I want to talk to you a little bit about the mission of an FFRDC and of our team specifically. Uh, not because I think it's terribly interesting for you, although it may be, uh, but because it's extremely relevant to the, the work that we're doing and to this presentation. So it, it'll kind of come into as, as background and why we came ac across this problem and why we're proposing some of the solutions and, and some of the tools that we're trying to develop to solve some of these problems. So an FFRDC is basically a, a research institute that is funded by the federal government to solve hard problems on behalf of the US government. Problems that the government can't solve on their own because they lack the resources or, or more, more, um, more commonly, they lack access to a specific set of expertise uh, or a specific set of knowledge. So the SEI fills that gap in the areas of cybersecurity, um, software engineering, software development, uh, and things like that. So we get funding from the federal government every year to help them solve hard problems in that area. I work for the CERT division of the SEI, um, which many of you may have heard of. Uh, you may have heard of the SEI as well. Uh, but the CERT division is really um, kind of the world's first coordinated incident response center really dating back all the way back to the 80s um, when, when the CERT division was founded within the SEI. Within the CERT division, I work for the security operations team. The security operations team, uh, much as the name might suggest, is responsible for helping to build security operations teams, incident response teams, with our partners both in the US federal government and with some of our partners around the world. So what we do every day on my team is we go out and we help to build incident response teams, C-certs, sector C-certs, SOCs, ISACs. And we've been doing this for a number of years. Personally, I've been involved with developing uh, more than two dozen different incident response teams in countries around the world. Uh, between the rest of my team and the research team that's worked on this project with me, we've built probably more than 100 incident response teams with our partners uh, both during our time at the SEI and collective time elsewhere with other organizations. So the point is we have a lot of experience in developing not only SOCs but other types of incident response teams. So keep that in mind for context as, as I go through kind of what, uh, what we're going to be talking about here today uh, and what we're trying to achieve or, or the problem that we're trying to solve. So I'm going to give a, a little bit of background about developing security operations centers or developing SOCs. I think a lot of you, if you're in this session, probably know a lot about building SOCs. What is a SOC? What goes into it? Um, but then we're going to start going into why we can do this better, how we can do this better. What knowledge do we need? What do we need to do this better and to solve this problem of building more effective security operations centers and doing it more quickly and on, on a bit of a tighter budget or maybe more affordably? After we kind of talk about that, I'm, we're going to propose, or I'm, we're proposing here in this research, a uh, SOC ontology that we think can be a tool to help practitioners do this in practice a little bit uh, more efficiently and a little bit better. So I'll talk about the ontology, uh, share some examples, and tell you what we're doing with that ontology and that body of knowledge. Uh, and then I'll wrap up by um, just going over a little bit about what we're going to do next and where we're taking this research next. Okay. so. Like I said, if you're in this session, you probably know what a security operations center is. You know, a, a SOC typically, keyword typically, uh, but not always, does things like monitoring, monitoring networks, um, monitoring information access or assets for threats, um, responding to any threats that are found, um, responding to a, a malicious attacks uh, or other activity that might be harmful to your organization. And you serve as a cybersecurity expert for your organization, right? Not groundbreaking stuff here, but this is what a SOC typically is going to do. But the point is, a SOC may not always do these things. 
or a SOC may do specific things beyond this. Maybe your SOC provides malware analysis services or digital forensic services. Maybe your SOC serves as an information hub, a lot of coordination and communication, vulnerability management. SOCs can do all of these things, but they don't necessarily always do all of those things. If you're familiar with the organization FIRST, uh, FIRST has what they call a CSERT services framework, and it breaks down all the things that an incident response team can do into about uh, eight different service areas, and then each of those service areas has different subservices. So there's maybe 60 or 70 different subservices that are identified as things that an incident response team may do, but to be an incident response team or to be a SOC, you don't have to do all of them. In fact, I've never encountered an, an incident response team or a SOC that does every single one of those services, right? It would be impossible. The resources required, the manpower required, all of that. You couldn't possibly do all these things. You have to pick and choose. And you pick and choose based on your organization's mission, their goals, what you're trying to accomplish, not only as an organization, but as a SOC. So you have to be able to pick and choose what services we're going to offer, and beyond that, what level of service I'm going to offer. If we're talking about malware analysis, are we going to do just surface analysis? Are we going to do reverse engineering? What level of service are you going to offer? So there's a lot of decisions to be made when you're building a SOC, right? When you're building any incident response team. So the problem is, is how, how do we do that? How do we make those decisions? Or, or more accurately, why are our socks hard to build? That's the problem that we have when we go and work with, some, with our partners, work with government agencies, work with foreign government partners, work with the private sector. How do we answer these questions? How do we build this sock to meet the needs of an organization that might be different than the other organization? The bottom line is, there's no such thing as sock in a box. You can't just take the sock that I built for this organization, pick it up, and put it down in another organization, because it's not going to work. This other organization has different needs, it has different priorities, and it has different capabilities. It may have a different threat environment. We see a lot of governments in different part, parts of the world face different APT level threats. You have to tailor your sock to meet those types of threats the services offered, the expertise that that SOC has, the amount of resources you put into different services. It's all specific. So you have to answer all of these questions, and you have to have the expertise necessary to answer these questions. What level of capability do I need for each of these service areas? What are my mission and goals? Um, how am I going to build this organization? What, what tools do I need? What technology do I need? Who, what people do I need to hire, and what skills do they need to have? What this represents over here, all this expertise, this represents a body of knowledge. It's a body of knowledge for building SOCs, and if you want to build an effective SOC or any effective organization, you have to have deep expertise in that body of knowledge. And now imagine you're, a, you're an SMB, uh, or you're a, a member of the, the DIB, the Defense Industrial Base. And maybe you're a new CISO, uh, you know, at a dev company, and you're trying to build a SOC capability. Do you have all this expertise? Can you answer all these questions at a really in-depth level that's necessary to build an effective SOC? Odds are probably the answer is no. Now, maybe you hire some consultants, bring in some out outside expertise, something like that. But at some point, someone's going to have to answer these questions. What we're proposing to do in our research is to build a tool that will codify this knowledge, codify this body of knowledge into an ontology. And I'll get to the ontology in a little bit here, but we hope that by taking this knowledge, putting it into this common body, into this ontology, we can help organizations reduce the time and cost needed to build a security operations center. So, how are we gonna do that? Well. I'll get into it a little bit more in depth here. But basically, we want to take all of those questions and answer them with a bunch of experts, get their answers, get their knowledge, 
and build it into this ontology. So this is a process. Um, and in fact, if I can go back here. So this is kind of a process that we would use uh, in, in our team when we go out in the field uh, and we're actually helping to build a security operations center or another incident response team. So we start, we have some framework we use. Um, you know, maybe it's based on, on this CSF or maybe it's based on international standards, ISO 2700, depending on where we're working. We do an assessment of an organization. We find out, okay, what, you know, what does this organization need? What capabilities do they have? Then we use our expert knowledge, our experience, to say, okay, to meet this organization's mission, we need certain people, we need to implement processes, you know, maybe some policies, maybe some con ops, write some SOPs, and then we need to implement technology. Tools, uh, a network architecture, other things, whatever this organization needs to, to um, build a SOC to help it fulfill its mission. Once we apply that, we're going to kind of use that knowledge to analyze data, come up with a set of recommendations. Uh, we review them with a partner, with the organization where we're developing a SOC or an incident response team. And then we go back and we do implementation. We implement, we help uh, you know, hiring people, we help um, building knowledge, we help developing you know, a, a list of a bill of materials or something for technology that needs to be acquired, and then installing and configuring things correctly, and then implementing processes. <clears throat> with a common body of knowledge, with an ontology, what we can do is automate a lot of this. So we can automate the assessment by just having a, a tool or a user interface where someone can go and answer a lot of questions that we would have asked. And then instead of having an expert who has to kind of sift through the assessment and look at some of the you know, some of the challenges that might be faced or some of the questions that are being answered, the ontology or, or the, the body of knowledge is going to provide those answers. So what we're doing is trying to automate this process and substitute the external expert, you know, the consultant or something who may be expensive, with a tool that can be used. It's important to note here that this tool is more than a framework. So an ontology is a way of representing, it's a formalization of, uh, that can be used for representing knowledge. I'll get to the ontology here in a little bit, but one of the questions that I get when I'm talking about this inevitably is, well, how's this different from just another framework? Is this just another framework? The answer is no. Um, this is not just another framework. This is a tool that can help make decisions for an organization based on needs and based on a set of inputs. So we'll get into that a little bit more here. Before we do though, <clears throat> again, just a little bit of background. People, processes, and technology, I already mentioned that a little bit. People, processes, and technology are kind of the three pillars of a SOC, the three main things that you need when you're building a SOC. So people, what jobs do I need? What roles do I need to fulfill? And again, think about when I'm answering those questions that I, I had up earlier, what is my mission? What, what services am, am I going to offer? Am I going to offer malware analysis services? Well, then you need someone with those skills, with the knowledge to do malware analysis. So that decision has to be made. Where is that decision made? Is it made at the C-suite level? Is it made at, at the CISO level or at the SOC level? Who's deciding whether or not this SOC should do malware analysis? Who's deciding what level of malware analysis they should do? And who's deciding how they should carry out that function? How they should, how they should staff it? They're gonna need specific tools. They're going to need specific processes to do that function or to offer that service to their organization, to their constituency. And for every different service, you're gonna to need to answer those same questions. So there's a lot of decision points and a lot of decisions which need to be made when you're building a SOC. If you want this SOC to be effective, you need to be able to answer those questions. So when we're starting to build this body of knowledge, you can see we can start to break it down into different knowledge areas, different classes of knowledge, different concepts. Okay, there's a concept for people. So when we're talking about people, we need to define that concept. 
what do, we mean, what do we mean when we say people? Is it just the individuals we're going to hire? Does it include those knowledge, skills, and abilities? Does it include training? I need a training plan for my people. I need professional development to keep them up to date on the latest, uh, latest and greatest technologies, latest and scariest threats, right? You can't just hire people and expect them to continue being experts or to, to continue doing good work years into the future. So you need all of these things if you want your SOC to be effective, and that is all things that can fall under the, the people class of knowledge. But a training plan, maybe that's a process, right? So you have to start defining all of these different types of, of knowledge when you're talking about SOC. You have to start breaking it down and categorizing it in, in this kind of fashion. So how did we do that? Well, as I said, my team has a lot of expertise and a lot of experience in this field in developing security operations centers, incident response teams, things like that. But we wanted to go beyond that. We wanted to get different perspectives, different viewpoints. So we went out and we interviewed different experts, SOC operations experts, people with um, experience in the field, people who have developed SOCs in different backgrounds and different settings. We interviewed 24 different experts um, from all around the world, all different regions of, of the world. People with experience in government, people with experience in private sector, um, small organizations, large organizations, critical infrastructure, pretty much every sector you can think of. We interviewed these experts, and what we did is we presented them with scenarios. Two or three scenarios per expert. Say, okay, you have to build a SOC for this SMB in the private sector. How would you do it? We kind of talk through a scenario. Okay, you have to build this SOC for a large government bureaucracy, a large government agency. How would you do it? What problems would you anticipate? How would you solve those problems? What kind of people, process, and technology might you implement in that specific situation? So 24 experts, two to three scenarios per expert, and we recorded these conversations, we recorded these interviews, and we looked at the transcripts. So you may say, oh, 24 is a low number. 24 is not the number of data points we have. For each of these, we averaged about 4,000 words per transcript. So we have 4,000 data points per interview times 24 interviews. We have just shy of 100,000 different data points of experts talking about building SOCs. So that's a lot of data. It's a lot of data to go through, and it's a lot of data to kind of build this body of knowledge and to build this ontology. Of those, of those transcripts, about 4,000 words, we averaged, I think, about 150 different knowledge classes that we identified in each transcript um, for SOC development. So 150 per, that's uh, a few thousand total different knowledge classes that we identified and pulled out of these, uh, pulled out of, the, out of these transcripts from our experts. So again, a lot of data to go back and to start, you know, kind of filling out this, this um, classification of the knowledge. Then we went back through these transcripts and looked at, okay, well, when they're, they're talking about these different classes of knowledge, these different categories of things you need in a SOC, what are the relationships? Maybe here they were talking about, oh, we need soft skills. Soft skills is really important for our SOC analysts. Okay, well, what kind of soft skills? And what, what problems did the soft skills help solve? Analytic challenges, you know, incident response challenges. Why do you need these soft skills? So we have to look for those relationships between the different classes, and we have to put those into the ontology as well. Uh, so this is just a quick look at what the data looks like. Uh, this is one of our, our interviews that, that we conducted. So we have answering you know, questions um, about SOC developments. Um, you know, we're going through one of the scenarios here, and what we can highlight, or what we can do is we highlight and we code out um, what are they talking about in each different kind of passage, or, or what are they talking about, um, what concept are they talking about here, and we start to build out this, uh, this coding panel over here. These are the concepts, these are the, these are the SOC concepts 
that we're identifying that they're talking about at different parts um, of the interview. So we can start to visualize it then and start to build a web of knowledge, a body of knowledge of sock things, basically. These are things that you need in a sock, according to the experts who have done sock development, who, who have built socks uh, in different settings, in different contexts around the world, right? So motivation, cost, threat, threat profile. Uh, what, what's your threat environment look like? When we talk about people, we talk about roles, we talk about skills. Uh, we have a whole category of things for, for planning, processes. Uh, this is a very early look at the hierarchy. Uh, this, is, this is what we call class hierarchy. Uh, it's significantly larger than this now, but um, it's too big now to fit in one screen, so, so we just have a kind of a subset here. Um, <clears throat> but this is what it starts to look like when we start to think about how do I develop a SOC, all these different categories. So with that, with all this knowledge and all this data that we've collected, the question is how do we use that to solve the problem? The problem is still how can we develop SOCs that are more effective and how can we do that uh, more quickly and more affordably? So we want to build an ontology. As I said, an ontology is a way of formally representing knowledge. It's more than a framework. It's a way of looking at different types of knowledge, um, different concepts, and relating those concepts to one another in a way where you can make inferences and kind of learn new things that aren't um, formally identified. So we haven't identified a relationship, but the ontology might identify a relationship by inferring things that we haven't specifically put into it. So an ontology uses what's called description logic. Description logic is different from first order logic in that it can do those types of inferences. Right? So um, we want to conceptualize the knowledge and we want to start putting it into an ontology. Our ontology uh, we call OSCAR. It's the Ontology for Sock Creation, Assistance, and Replication. Uh, OSCAR is continuing to grow. Uh, he's, he's getting quite large. We have some, I think, 900 different concepts uh, in OSCAR right now. And we have about 200 object properties, which are, are relationships in an ontology. Uh, a relationship is referred to as an object property. <clears throat> Oscar is a tool that can be used to help develop socks by helping both experts and non-experts answer some of the questions about what do I need when I want to build a sock. If I want to build a sock, here, here are my missions. I can provide a set of input about what is my mission? What does my threat environment look like? What is my budget? What other constraints do I have? And Oscar can help you to identify what you need to fulfill your SOC mission based on that set of constraints. <clears throat> okay, so with the, the, all the data that we gathered from our experts and everything, how, how do we build Oscar? Well, we start by analyzing the data and sort of looking at you know, what, what are the big classes of knowledge? What, what did everyone keep coming back to? Incidents, people, tools, security, right? All these big concepts that all of our experts kept coming back to regardless of the scenario that, that they were presented with. And we can start to create a framework based on that, which is that kind of people process technology, but then some of the other higher level concepts, we identified beyond people processes and technology, we identified planning, and we also identified organizational considerations as the two biggest factors that should be considered when developing a SOC. So planning is, how am I going to do this? What do I need to do to get from, yes, I want a SOC, to here I actually have a SOC that's been implemented. And the biggest challenge there is implementation, right? All of the experts that we talked to, or almost all of the experts we talked to said, it's easy to write down on paper that I want to build a SOC. It's easy to go to my C-suite and say, hey, we need to implement a SOC. 
it's really difficult to implement because you have to get funding. You have to hire people. You have to buy technology and get it configured correctly. You have to probably wrestle away some authority or some turf from other organizations that already exist within your organization. You know, the IT department is probably doing some SOC things. If you already have a C-cert, they're probably doing some SOC things. And you're going to have to work with those organizations, and there's going to be tension, there's going to be friction. So planning considerations, um, and then business considerations, right? So we, we refer to these um, in our research as the bitter criteria. Business, um, business, information technology, IT, a threat, and regulatory. So what is my business priorities? What are my business needs? Uh, are we trying to make money? Are we trying to provide a service? How does my SOC support that, right? Because a SOC is ultimately just a support organization for whatever your business's main goal is. Unless you're a cybersecurity company, your company's goal, your organization's goal is not cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is something that enables your company's goal, your organization's goal. Information technology, obviously, what does my network look like? Um, what does my um, information technology environment look like? Am I in Windows? Am I in Linux? Do I have a lot of public-facing um, websites? Or, you know, or do we have a point of sale system? What kind of network, what kind of assets am I defending? Threat, obviously, what's my threat environment? Do I face a lot of APTs? What kind of attacks do I typically see? And then regulatory, what do I have to comply with? What's my regulatory compliance requirements? Um, <clears throat> so we create that framework. We start to look at those, those different categories, um, those two new ones, and then the people, process, and technology. We break it down. We validated our data with some survey uh, research that we did, both with our experts and, and some other people. Um, and then we started to model this in the ontology. So the ontology uh, uses what's called web ontology language, or OWL. Um, OWL is just a, a syntax, uh, um, which I'll, I'll show here in a second. But this is, um, this is in description logic. So description logic, just like any logic, uses operators um, to define relationships and, and to define classes. So this example looks at the monitoring and detection service area. So like I said, a lot of different service areas go into a, a SOC. A SOC can do a lot of different services. Monitoring detection is just one of those. So if we want to define the monitoring and detection service area, first we have to define some concepts. So we can say that a SOC analyst is a type of people. So SOC analyst is a subconcept of the concept people. We can say that a SOC level one analyst and a SOC level two analyst are disjoint, meaning you can't be both. Right? So if you're a SOC level one analyst, you are not a SOC level two analyst. No instance of either of those classes can be in both classes. Right. Um, we can define technologies, we can find, define different things. Once we've defined the concepts and define all these, um, these classes, by the way, I'm using concept and class interchangeably. Uh, in description logic, they're called concepts, uh, but when we get into OWL, uh, web ontology language, they're called classes. Uh, it's the same thing, it's just one's in, in the logical uh, um, representation and one is in the uh, the actual language that we're writing this in. Um, <clears throat> so once we've defined those concepts, we can go back and introduce axioms. We can say that if I want to have a monitoring and detection service at a level three, I need to have more than two, greater than or equal to two people who are some SOC analyst. And that's an and operator, it's, it means union, I also have to have a technology that is a network monitoring tool. So at level three, if, I'm, if I have a SOC that wants to offer monitoring and detection services at level three, I need at least two SOC analysts and I need a network monitoring tool. If I want to go from level three to level four, 
this is a higher level of service, I need to have some more additional capabilities. So now I also have to have a network use policy. I have to have a SOC level one analyst and a SOC level two analyst. So you see we're, in, we're introducing more complexity uh, in addition to more capability. So before we just had to have two SOC analysts, which was undefined, but at a level four, we're now saying that we have to have a level one analyst and a level two analyst to provide us this higher level of capability. And then we have to have technology, uh, both a network monitoring tool and some data asset inventory. So you can see that we can start to define as we increase the level of service, we increase the number of classes of knowledge or concepts of knowledge that have to be represented as, as true. So when we go back to the beginning and we're talking about how do I use this ontology, right? <clears throat> if you go through the, uh, the user interface and you start to identify that, okay, you know, I have a certain threat environment, I have a certain regulatory requirement, the ontology may identify based on those inputs, well, you have a high threat environment and a, a restrictive a regulatory environment, you need monitoring and detection service at level five. If you need monitoring and detection service at level five, here are all the things that you need for your, um, for your SOC. Um, so again, that's how it looks in description logics. This is how it looks in uh, the, the tool that we use is called Protege, uh, but this is web ontology language. Uh, this is the same exact thing. This is um, Monitoring detection service area. This is actually level five. It says right there level three. I don't know why it says that. Um, it's kind of a, it's a bug in the program. Um, but you see, you know, in level five, we've, we've added some additional things beyond what was in level four. There's now a requirement for a risk management policy um, and an enterprise asset management tool uh, and 24 seven staffing requirement, right? So as we go up that uh, complexity chain, we offer more capabilities uh, for that particular service area. Um, just going to wrap up here talking about where we want to go next with this research and building this tool and then leave a, a few minutes for questions uh, or comments or, or anything else. So long term what we want to do is we want to take this ontology and develop it into what's called an expert system. Uh, expert system will be a, a little bit more complicated tool that will have some additional capabilities and be able to solve problems a, a little bit more uh, in depth. So we want to continue developing OSCAR, continue developing um, the ontology, and then we'll basically be applying what's called an inference engine to it and building that expert system. Um, right now, OSCAR, or, or the work that we've done on OSCAR is heavily focused on government because obviously we're, as I, I mentioned, we're a, a government research center uh, and, and we're, you know, our research and our work is funded by the government. Uh, we'd love to be able to expand it to keep adding uh, new, new knowledge to it uh, in the future so it can be applied in more situations uh, or more diverse situations or settings. Uh, but that's kind of a, a future, future task. Uh, and this is kind of um, what the, the architecture of the tool will look like, uh, hopefully in its final state. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it. So um, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. And uh, looks like we have eight minutes and 58 seconds left for, for questions. Go ahead. I'm coming with the mic. Uh, uh, there's, she has a mic. Thank you. Thank you for, for the information and everything, great information. When you were talking about the trees, when you were talking about people, process, and you're in that part that you're trying to decide um, what type of people to hire, how do you get to those conclusions or how do you start uh, on what I'm trying to solve, what's the business case for this? What do you look at? Because if you're starting an operation, you, you don't know which type of engineers you want to hire or you need to hire, right? So how would you recommend to approach Yeah, yeah, and that's, what I would say that that is the exact type of question that we hope this ontology will be helpful in answering. So the answer to that question, and this is, this is my favorite answer, the answer is it depends, right? So what type of people you're going to hire 
is going to depend on what exactly you want your sock to do, right? So if your sock needs to be able to respond and mitigate an APT threat, APT level threat within 24 hours, you know, your staffing level is going to need to be here. If your sock only ever anticipates seeing sort of like, you know, low, le low level attacks, maybe DDoS attacks, something like that, if those are the only threats you're worried about, then your staffing level needs to be down here. If your SOC sees a lot of really complicated things, um, your, your, your SOC is at being asked to do digital forensics, your SOC is being asked to do vulnerability management, you're being asked to do all these different things, again, staffing level is going to need to be up here. If your SOC is only being asked to do monitoring and detection, staffing level down here. So it depends. Your staffing is going to be dependent on what is my threat environment? What are my business requirements? How complicated is my IT environment? You know, do I have a big complex network with multiple locations? Or do I just have one enterprise network that's very compact geographically and logically? And then regulatory environment. Um, you know, do I have to comply with a lot of regulatory requirements? Um, and is that the mission of my SOC or, or not? So it's going to depend. Oscar, our, our um, ontology, is going to, it will help you answer some of those questions by receiving the input that says basically, here is my threat environment. You know, Oscar will ask questions about your threat environment, will ask questions about your regulatory requirements. And then based on that, will provide inputs and recommendations for staffing level. The connection is all of that expert knowledge that we've pulled in. So again, 24 different experts, plus our experience, plus you know, some other frameworks and things we've pulled together. And we've, we've kind of said, you know, if you have a high threat environment and a, and a high level regulatory environment, you're going to need this level of staffing. So it's going to make those kind of inferences based on, on the inputs. Um, so yeah, that, that's a great question, because that's exactly what we're, we're trying to answer and solve. So piggy piggybacking at, um, at his question, I, I have two questions. So currently, where, where, where does Oscar ingest use cases? And uh, when in, or where, again, does Oscar account for the metrics to be tracked? Can you say that last part again? The last part? The last part, yeah. Yep. Where does, or when does Oscar um, consider the metrics to be tracked for the SOC? Yeah, so, so metrics is a really hard thing, right? Metrics <clears throat> for, for any type of instant response, for any type of cybersecurity is, is a big challenge. Um, I would say that Oscar really doesn't do metrics. Um, it's more... I'd say it's more, oh, what's the word? Um, it's more qualitative rather than quantitative, right? So it's not making these inferences. It's not built to, you know, kind of say, well, once you hit, you know, three DDoS attacks a week, then you need to bump up to a level two uh, or, you know, at five DDoS attacks, it's a level three. Um, it, it's more kind of, you know, what is your threat environment for DDoS attacks, high, medium, low? And based on that, it, it will kind of make, make decisions. So it's, it's categorized, um, but it's not a lot of specific metrics that it's using to, to make decisions, if that makes sense. You know, I, I would talk about the, uh, the user interface a little bit more and the expert system a little bit more, uh, but that's restricted research, so I can't talk about it here. Um, which would probably help to answer some of your questions. We hope to be able to publish that eventually, uh, but there's a, a long approvals process that we'll have to go through. Yeah, your presentation talked about building socks in totality. I'm wondering, is there a discrete use case for, let's say, for someone who wants to become a SOC analyst or someone who is a SOC level one analyst who may want to escalate their skills? Yeah, it's, it's very focused organizationally. It's, it's, it's focused organizationally. I would say that it looks at organizational capabilities. So we could say that 
maybe not building a full sock, but building a sock capability, um, but it, it wouldn't be individual for, for people, yeah. So I'm curious, as uh, resources, we know resources in different companies are usually pretty tight, especially yeah. when it comes to security, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, are you taking into account making rec potential recommendations for third-party integrations or for different services based yeah. upon the complexity um, listed yeah. in, the, yeah. in the questionnaire? That's actually a great question. I'm really glad you asked it because it, it gives me an opportunity to I missed earlier. I do have one caveat. Uh, this is heavily focused on on-premise SOC integrations, um, and that is a result of basically the, the funding that we're receiving from the government. Um, we do on-premise SOC implementations, so that's what, what our focus is. We have in our um, here, oh, again, this is an earlier version. In the, the current version, we do have like a third-party services knowledge class, so that's part of it. Um, but it, it's not a big part of, of what we do. Um, so that is probably one of the, the future things that we'd love to add and, and get into more uh, because it's such a big part, especially in the private sector, managed services and things like that. But it's not a big part of Oscar right now. Yeah. I have a minute and 26 seconds left. Quick question regarding budgets. Yeah. What, what, what money are we talking about here? How many millions? Uh, can you specify a little bit on that? Yeah, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're, uh, you're asking about like SOC development budget, right? Implementation. Yeah, yeah, implementation budget. So there's kind of two ways we can handle that question. Um, and and we're not, we haven't quite settled on how we're gonna do that. One is that we could take the, the perspective of just saying, well, what you need to secure your organization or what you need to fulfill your mission is agnostic of budget, right? J just because your budget is only $1 million doesn't mean you can successfully build a, an effective SOC on that budget. Here's what you need. You know, maybe Oscar can just tell you, here's what you need. A, you know, good luck fitting that into your existing budget. I think there's an argument for that if we're really focused on what is necessary for security. But the reality is that, yes, there are, there are restrictions on budget, right? So that can be one of the restrictions that we would build into the, the assessment. So business, information technology, threat, regulation, and budget. So if my budget is one million or less, is my budget you know, one million to five million, whatever, we can do some categories or things like that. The problem is, that then we have to start to identify how much each of these things cost. And we have to keep those things up to date in the ontology because costs change. So how much does a SIM cost? Well, it depends on how much data you're processing, right? Um, how much does a SOC level one analyst cost? Well, it depends on where you are, largely. So it's hugely, hugely complicated. Um, ideally, I'd love to be able to do that but it's, it's a complication that has proved beyond our, uh, let's just say beyond our research budget at the time. Um, so, um, you, you know, the reality is it, it would be great to add in the future. We don't have that built in right now. So our approach is just to say, to be secure, here's what you need. It's your job now to fit that within your budget. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I, again, I appreciate it. And, uh, Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>